Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast. Don't experiment with your safety, choosing the right lab coat, sponsored by Bulwark Protection. This is Alan Ferguson, Associate Editor at Safety and Health Magazine, and I am moderating today's learning opportunity. Thank you all for joining us. And before we start this presentation, I have to go over some preliminary items. As a disclaimer, the views of today's speaker and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those in the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. Next, I want to let you know that at the end of today's webcast, we will conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the button for Submit Question. Feel free to ask your question at any time during this presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A to begin. Now, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but we might not have time to get to every question. The good news is that any unanswered questions will be forwarded to today's speaker. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey, and I will let you know more about that after this presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To listen to this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. Finally, if you need basic troubleshooting information, click the Help button located on your screen. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Mark Sainer, Technical Services Manager with Bulwark. Mark has more than 35 years of experience with chemical protective and flame resistant clothing. His areas of expertise include technical support, safety standards, and product development. He previously worked for the WorkRight Uniform Company and Akron Brass. Mark, whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Alan. And uh, likewise, I welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar. Uh, before I get into the meat of the webinar, I will likewise uh, do my little uh, legal disclaimer here for everyone. Uh, customers of Bulwark Protective brands are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard assessments so that they can identify safety hazards in their specific workplace. Uh, customers of Bulwark brands are solely responsible for selecting appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, bulk work protective apparel does not make any representations that these garments and protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So with that said, let's get started. When you look at um, talking about protecting laboratories, one of the things we see is Across the country, there are lots of workers in the labs. We're, we estimate some 800,000 workers uh, across the country, uh, 300,000 of those being in the higher education research lab laboratories, and then there's another half a million in just industrial general uh, type uh, applications, including the government. So lots of people out there that are working in these areas that have the need to be protected from various things. So that's why we think it's important to make products and provide uh, training and information uh, to the public. So one of the first things we're going to talk about are FR lab coats or flame resistant lab coats. Why are they important? Why would they be something that you would want to consider to use in your laboratory. When we look at laboratories and we see lots of different hazards out there, two of the most common hazards that are noted uh, in all the information we read is fire and explosion hazards, which is where the FR part takes place, and also chemical hazards, whether it be with acids, corrosives, pyrophoric materials, whatever it might be. So there's lots of different hazards, but fire and explosions and chemicals seem to be, seem to be two of those that will kind of rise to the top as most concerning or most frequent. And when we look back at what kind of accidents have happened over the years, we see there are a number of them. You see there's explosions from aqueous, aqueous hydrogen peroxide. There was a uh, explosion at Texas Tech, also one at the uh, University of Hawaii. And the one that's probably the most uh, notable is the uh, accident that happened at uh, UCLA. This is where the young researcher was uh, transferring a pyrophoric material. Uh, it got loose. 
auto ignited, caught her clothes on fire, and uh, eventually she died from her uh, accident, from her injuries. So a very severe case, uh, but extremely uh, poignant in terms of showing what can happen with an accident. It can go from a minor thing to all the way to a fatality if you're not careful, if you're not prepared, if you don't take all the necessary steps or have the right PPE uh, when these kind of things happen. So, uh, you know, it's something we want want to avoid happening in the future. And when we look at burn injuries that happen in these different kinds of situations in laboratories, the chemical safety boards collected a lot of data and over a uh, 17 year period, you can see that there are 261 explosions, fires, chemical re- uh, releases in academic laboratories during that time period. So it, it's not something that's a once in a while. It happens pretty regularly. And out of those 261, you can see there's, you know, 500 fatalities and 491 injuries that took place in those 261 explosions, fires, et cetera. So, you know, it happened probably more than we think. And it can be extremely uh, dangerous, five fatalities, 491 injuries. Those are the kind of things we want to try and mitigate. We want to try and uh, avoid, if all possible, for obvious reasons. And so let's look at what are some of the uh, flammable chemicals that are used in laboratories. There's a ton of them. You look down through this list, and you can see that there's uh, just oodles of them on there that can have a problem if they're released, if they get into the air, if there's a um, ignition source, uh, any of these flammables and combustibles that are very common in laboratories can be a problem. So we know that the hazard is out there. We know it exists. We've seen it happen in the past. We know the chemicals are there that can cause the problem. So we need to look at ways that we can uh, try and avoid these uh, situations from happening. So let's talk a little bit about burn injuries. When you try and measure burn injuries and how that's going to affect uh, the human body, oftentimes the extent, the percentage of area that's been burned is more critical than the actual severity of the burn injury itself in terms of survival rates, correlating survival rates. So when we look at the total surface area, the amount of percentage area of your body that's had burn injuries, Oftentimes, the medical field, they'll look at it, and they'll kind of divide it up into quadrants. So you look at those different quadrants that they put around the body, whether it's in the arm area, the leg area, the head area, et cetera, and you add those up. And that's where they get their first estimate on the uh, total body surface area, which is critical to what kind of treatments you're going to get and odds of survival. Again, remember, the extent of burn injury is much more critical to the survival rate than is the actual severity of it itself. So when we look at second and third degree burns, anywhere in excess of 50% is where you really start looking at potentials for fatalities. That's when the numbers start to go up in terms of uh, fatalities, when that second and third degree burns in excess of 50% of the uh, surface area of the body. And when we talk about, and most everybody knows this, but when we talk about first, second, and third degree burn, first degree burn, redness, pain, not permanent, basically you're talking about a sunburn. When you talk about second degree burn, now you're getting into the skin starts to blister. It will regenerate, but by blistering, it opens up a pathway for infection. So that's where second degree burn can be a problem. And then obviously the worst is the third degree burn. This is when it's very, very deep burn, it doesn't regenerate. It's going to require grafting. So those kind of, that's how we look at the actual severity of the burn injury and how it correlates to the um, uh, injury to the person. Now, when we try and connect that to the survival rate, again, as we said, that correlates more directly to the uh, extent or the uh, extent of burn injury. So when you look at the green bar, 25% body burn, you can see in all those different age groups, all of them are really high uh, chances of survival. They're all in the 90-plus range of survival rates in those uh, 25% body burn area. When you get to 50% body burn, it's still pretty high. You can see in all those age groups, they're fairly high. They're in the 60, 70, up towards 90. Even in the older age group, you're still in 60-plus percent 
uh, chance of um, survival rate. Now, when you put in the 50-50 line, you get below 50% or get above 50% body burn injury in that 75 range. You can see how the survival rate starts to drop off uh, significantly. The younger groups, eh, you know, they're still in the 50-50 range. But you get down into the older groups, the chance survival starts to drop off significantly. You're in the 40s, 30s, you know, 15% chance of survival. So keeping that percent of body burn to as low as possible is a critical factor in uh, surviving any kind of uh, uh, exposure to a flame and heat type situation. So then you not only have the burn pain and injury and all that suffering, but also there's a significant cost for burn injuries. Burn injuries are one of the most costly type injuries you can have. When you look at burn treatment, you're looking at being in the burn ward for one and a half days for every percentage of your body burn area. So that, that can be a significant number of days. And the average hospital stay for those people in that 40 to 60% body burn, you're looking at 54 days, it, you know, a month and a half in the hospital and it, the cost is really high. You're talking somewhere in the range of $25,000 a day. So you do the math on that, and it gets to be a really expensive proposition. Again, not to mention all the pain and suffering that goes along with it. So how does the hospital cost total start to range? You're looking at anywhere from, you know, 200000 750000 sometimes over a million dollars just in the hospital costs alone. And that's just while you're in the hospital. The lifetime cost of all the other kinds of rehab and suffering and so forth, you're looking at in the tens of millions of dollars. So it's extremely painful and it's extremely costly to have uh, major burn injuries. So trying avoiding that at all costs is, uh, is very, very important. And so Who's responsible for the employees, the people working in the labs, keeping them safe? Well, according to OSHA, it's the employer. The employer is responsible to provide a place of employment that's free from recognized hazards that are going to cause either death or serious injury. So if you're working with flammables, if you have ignition sources, that's an obvious hazard that's recognized. The employer is responsible for making sure that those employees are safe and they have the right type of um, safety requirements, protocols, PPE that they can have in their uh, laboratory to make sure they're not going to have one of those uh, injuries. So we talked about OSHA is the shall. This is what you should do. The standards then, the standards on PPE, for example, those are written by other uh, industry consensus organizations like NFPA, ANSI, ASTM, they write the rules for the PPE and how they have to perform and what they do and how they protect and those types of things. So OSHA tells you you got to do it, and then you look to the standards that write the rules for the performance requirements of the particular PPE that you might be implementing into your laboratory. So look for some kind of a consensus standard uh, information on the garment or about the garment that you might want to look to. So when you're setting up uh, safety uh, policies and uh, protocols and so forth, there's kind of a hierarchy of the controls you can put into place. So, for example, if you look at this list here, uh, going from the uh, most effective down to the least effective, elimination is obviously the best. If you can eliminate the hazard altogether, then that's the best uh, uh, situation. You can get into substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, you know, protocols, telling people how to handle uh, flammable chemicals and so forth. And then at the very bottom is PPE. And, you know, at, at the bottom, however, PPE can be extremely important because it's kind of the last line of defense. If all the rest of your hierarchy doesn't work, if you have your engineering controls don't work, your administrative controls fall flat, then you've got PPE as your last line of defense. And I use this image as an example. This is your seat belt. You talk about seat belts being, you know, old fashioned. They've been around for many, many, many years. And you've got newer technology. You've got uh, 
you know, titanium cabs, you've got airbags, you've got uh, side mirrors that tell you when you've got people in your blind spots, any lock brakes. you got all this safety equipment on your car, but everybody still wears a seatbelt. And why do they do that? Because it's a last line of fence. But it doesn't work unless you're wearing it and wearing it correctly. And that holds true also with PPE in the laboratory. You can have a great PPE, but you also have to make sure that it's worn and it's worn properly. And where does that come into play in the rules? OSHA. OSHA also says not only that you have to protect your people, you have to train them. You have to train them on what PPE they have, you know, when it's necessary to wear it, you know, what PPE is it that you have for them, how to properly put it on, take it off, adjust it, any limitations that it might have, how to properly care for it, and you have to make sure that the employee demonstrates an understanding of all the information you trained them on. You have to document that you've done the training. So when OSHA comes in, if they do an inspection, they're going to look to see, do you have PPE in there, and do you have records that show that you did, in fact, train your employees on all these things, when, what, how, et cetera. So not only important to have it, and to uh, and or eliminate the hazards altogether, but you also have to train the people on what it is and you know how it's supposed to be worn. So there's lots of rules in there, but it's very important. Protection of your people is an extremely important aspect. So we talked a lot about you know uh, the flammable hazards where you could have a flash, you could expose them to ignite their clothing and so forth. But the other hazard that we have in the laboratories is also chemical and chemical splash. So when you look back at that chart I showed earlier that showed some of the most common hazards, we had the fire and explosions, but also chemical hazards are also very common in laboratories. And you're working with a lot of nasty stuff in there. So you take a look at all these chemicals that you might be lifting, whether they're acid corrosives, oxidizers, organic solvents, you know, you've got sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, you've got uh, nitric acid, acetonitrile, you've got lots of nasty stuff that you don't want to get on your skin. You know, there, it's, I've been told by many lab safety people that chemical splash is much more common than the, the flash fire type explosions. Um, because there are just so many of them out there. You're working with them every day. You might not be working with the flammables every day. So flammables are much more dangerous in terms of the outcome, you know, in terms of the survivability, but chemical splashes are much more frequent than they do happen. And they have their downside too. They Obviously, they're going to cause some injuries. And here's an example. This was a worker that was doing an experiment and I'll just read you the quote here of what she said. I was filtering the chemical when my hand slipped and the solution splashed onto my forearm. I learned the hard way. Hopefully others can take that experience and realize they need to be wearing a lab coat. This is a lab worker that was doing a, a function that she's done a hundred times, no big deal, shouldn't be a problem, never had a problem before, boom. That's when the problem happened. That's when an accident happened. That's why it's called an accident. Didn't expect it, didn't have PPE on, and you can see. Wasn't fatal, but he's got a heck of a scar on that forearm. So just proves the point that having the PPE and wearing it when you're supposed to wearing it and knowing when to wear it is, is critical. So when you look at splash, chemical splash hazards. So what do people wear today to protect against them? There's rubberized splash aprons, there's sleeves, you've got disposables uh, that you can put on, disposable gowns. Uh, you can go as far as the complete barrier suits, a hazmat suit that'll protect you. All those things work and all those things can provide some protection, but are they the best solution? You know, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And what if you have both hazards? What if you have the flammables and the chemicals, which is not uncommon? One of the problems with the chemical suits is most of them are, uh, they're flammable. They aren't flame resistant. So if you have a, a flame situation, if you have a flash, they're going to ignite. So they work for the chemicals, but not for the flame. 
And uh, some may be flame resistant, but they're also typically uncomfortable. They don't breathe. Uh, they may not cover the entire body. As you can see with these apps, uh, these aprons, they don't cover the, the upper part, the, you know, the shoulders and maybe the chest, the arms. They can also be restrictive in your motion, trying to move around. And one of the most important factors is it's a secondary piece. You must remember to wear it. And this comes into play when uh, we were working with the University of California after the UCLA incident. Uh, they went into uh, flame-resistant lab coats. Everybody across the system was issued a flame-resistant lab coat. And as a secondary for their splash, they had a splash apron. Well, when I was speaking with the head of their uh, EHS group, their safety group, he he said to me, "Is one concern, or one con one of his many concerns, but one of them was that secondary apron. That person has to remember to go put it on. They got to remember where it is. You know, do I need it? When do I need it?" And it's a secondary thing they have to remember, and that leads to potential for human error. And that bothered him. He didn't like that case. So, you know, some of the other things you run into, you've got heat stress, lack of comfort, and, again, must remember to wear it. His comment to me was, hey, can't we come up with one lab coat? Everybody has to wear their lab coat, and it solves both problems. It's rid of or gives you protection against both hazards. And that's, that's what we ended up coming up with. So trends in clothing, lighter weight, more comfortable, multifunction. Like I said, they want it to be both flame resistant and chemical protection. They get rid of that decision making. So coming up with a product that will give you all these benefits is really where the, the marketplace is uh, moving towards. Everybody's going to be in these all day long, so they've got to have the comfort they may be working with both types of chemicals that could create flashes or chemical splash. And if they're wearing it all day, they don't have to think about where's my secondary splash apron. You know, where did I put it last time? Did somebody borrow it? I can't remember. <clears throat> so what would we consider the ideal lab coat? So number one, flame resistant. You want to protect against those flammables and ignition sources. Number two, chemical splash protection, because it's very common out there. And then three, you want it to be comfortable. You want it to be lightweight, feel soft, breathable, and you want it to fit. You want to have a men's uh, design, a women's cut, because there are lots of uh, men and women working in these laboratories. So those are all the uh, things that you would like to have in a lab coat. So how does the FRCP lab coat that was developed uh, – that's in the work or the bulwark uh, system, how does that compare to this? Well, it is flame resistant, made with Nomax 3A fabric. It does have chemical splash repellency. It's got the uh, Millican Shield CXP uh, technology applied to it. It's only four and a half ounce weight, very soft to the feel, has almost 200 cubic feet per minute air permeability, and there are women's and men's cuts. So it kind of fills all those boxes for the uh, ideal lab coat. But how does it perform? Here's an example of a test that um, uh, was run where we took a uh, piranha solution, three parts sulfuric acid, one part hydrogen peroxide, and put it on these different fabrics. The one on the left is the, the new chemical splash protective uh, product with the Shield CXP uh, technology on it. The one in the middle is a standard FR product. And the one on the far right is probably what most of you are wearing today, just a white poly cot lab coat. So how does it perform when we put that piranha solution on it? Well, as you can see, it's poured onto the, um, the Shield, CXD, Shield CXP product, and it just kind of sits there, puddles up, nothing happens. You pour it onto the one in the middle, the FR fabric, and it starts to eat through it right away. And as you can see on the left there, it's still pooled up on the uh, Shield CXP. And then when you pour it onto the uh, poly cotton, man, it starts to really burn through quickly. And the end result, you can see the difference. Shield CXP is still pooled up on top there, no penetration. 
the typical FR, it's burned all the way through, and then the uh, poly cotton, it just blew right through in no time. So as you can see, the big difference when you splash some of that on you, Shield CXP is going to repel that. Regular FR is going to have some potential for it to uh, burn through, and then the non-FR uh, poly cotton, it's boom, it goes through in no time. So which one's going to give you the most protection? I think it's obvious from this. So one of the things I mentioned in the training was you have to tell your people what it can do and what it can't do. What are the limitations? So this particular fabric is designed for small amounts of inadvertent liquid chemical splashes at atmospheric pressure. It's not for large amounts. It's not for when you pour a, you know, if you dump a five-gallon bucket of chemical onto yourself. It's not when you're going in where you expect to have large splashes on you. It's not for under pressure. If you have a line break of some sort that has a chemical in it and it's spraying out under pressure, it's not what it's for. This is at atmospheric pressure. And it's not for all chemicals. You know, it works for most acids, corrosives, poor organic solvents but it doesn't do well with non-polars. So it doesn't work for everything, but the current coat, the white poly cotton coat, doesn't work for anything. So it gives you a huge advantage over uh, what most people are wearing today. And when we talk about the uh, chemicals that it works well with, you're talking about corrosives like sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, hydrofluoric acid, oxidizers, nitric, piranha solution like we used in the uh, demonstration, hydrogen peroxide, and then other polar organic solvents, acetonitro, methanol, ethanol, a bunch of polars. When you get into the non-polars, then it's not going to do much in the way of repelling. We're talking about heptane, hexane, acetone, toluene, those types of things. It just, it can't do everything. The way to get everything is you go back to the rubberized suits that are uncomfortable, don't breathe. And secondary, you've got to go find and remember to wear them. So I'd like to show this example. If you remember back when I talked about the incident at UCLA, the young worker was working with a pyrophoric material, and that's what caught her clothes on fire. This is the exact same situation. Uh, a researcher was wearing the new FRCP lab coat, and this is the quote from the uh, safety lab safety person that I got. The pyrophoric chemical was on fire and got onto her coat, but it self-extinguished itself. Her clothes underneath are not affected at all. I get chills just thinking what would have happened had she not been wearing an FRCP lab coat. The exact same situation as UCLA with a completely opposite uh, result. As you can see, there's some flash burns where it burn off some of the dye out of the the royal blue coverall, but her clothing underneath were not affected at all. Had she not been wearing this, her clothes would have caught on fire. She would have got significant burn injury, probably a significant amount of burn injury, and we might have been looking at another case like at UCLA, and that's what we want to try and avoid. That's what you don't want to happen in your laboratory. So this is a, a prime example of what a proper people piece of PPE, a proper lab coat can do to help protect your workers from uh, accidents that could be extremely dangerous. So in the, in the line of products that are uh, available to Bulwark, you've got your standard FR coats, which, you know, if that's your hazard, then that's, uh, that's a good product. Also got the FRCP that gives you the dual hazard, both the flame and the uh, chemical splash. And it's also available in a coverall uh, design as well. So having the right product, implementing it, making sure people wear it uh, all day, every day, is going to go a long way to try and provide the safety, the uh, information, the, the type of hazard assessment you know that you want to that you want to have in your workplace so you do your hazard assessment you provide the right ppe and that's going to provide a much safer uh, work situation for your people so alan that's that's the end of the presentation if there's any questions uh, i'm happy to answer them
Hi, first I want to say thank you, Mark, for your expertise and insightful presentation. And before we start the q and I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey we're asking to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now. Your input is important because it will help us improve our future webcast. If you do not see the evaluation survey on your screen, please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. And as a reminder, um, for the Q&A, you can type your questions in the uh, text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And so we'll get to the first question here. Um, is, is the disposable clothing wearable until contaminated, or is there a general shelf life on this kind of clothing? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm not really not in much of the disposable business, but typically uh, there's not a shelf life on the disposables, and it would be one of those if it gets um, if it gets contaminated or it gets torn or you know gets uh, dirty because they're not launderable, they're disposable. You, uh, most people wear them wear them once and um, or maybe twice, and then. Uh, dispose of them. So, and and obviously, anytime you, you have an incident where it gets uh, contaminated with some kind of a splash on it, then uh, it would be um, you'd need to dispose of it and get a replacement. So, hopefully, that answers the question. So, there's a there's a question coming up about uh, polypropylene lab coats. Uh, Person asks, uh, cases have been recorded where personal handling flammables while wearing a polypropylene lab coat experienced static electricity that created an ignition source. Have you heard of this? Uh, I've not heard of it, but you know, static electricity, um, you know, can be an issue. Um, so you know, you want to be careful about that. If you're in an environment where uh, you have some kind of a flammable vapor. Re could have a flammable vapor release where static could be a problem, uh, then you're going to probably want to take steps beyond just the PPE. You're going to want to have some kind of grounding uh, devices set up so that you can actually ground the wearer because that's, you know, part of the problem. The, uh, the FRCP lab coat uh, is made with a Nomax 3A fabric, and it has some um, anti-static fibers in it, but they're – they're for situations where you're just trying to avoid static cling, basically, nuisance static. They're not for a static-free environment. So if you need to be in a static-free environment, then, uh, you know, you're going to have to look for a specialized garments, and you're probably going to need to uh, do some kind of grounding of the uh, wearers, whether it's grounding mats or uh, grounding straps or some other kind of grounding uh, situation to make sure that uh, – there isn't going to be a static release that could cause some kind of explosion. Our next question, how do um, EHS professionals better convey to researchers that they are required to uh, provide the uh, correct PPE for their employees? <laughs> well, um, I would say that, you know, you, you want to go through the training, number one. Everybody has to be trained, and uh, you want to make sure they understand the risks, uh, you know, and the outcomes if they don't follow the protocols, if they don't wear the proper PEE. Um, and, uh, you know, you have to set up some rules. The rule is if you have the right product, if you've got the um, lab coat that gives you the protection you want, the rule is when you walk through the door, you put it on and you leave it on until you leave. Um, now, how do you implement that? How do you enforce that? You know, that, that's something that the individual lab is going to have to figure out. Um, I don't have any magic answer to, for that. But as I said in the slides earlier, by having the lab coat that has both types of hazard protection eliminates that need for a decision for that worker to decide, yes, I need my chemical splash garment now or my apron or whatever it might be or i'm you know i i'm working with some flammables i better put on my flame resistant version of it if you have a lab coat that gives you both hazard protections and the rule is it's on as soon as you come in and it's on all day every day that should help to you know provide that uh, kind of protection you're looking for 
Our next question, what is the cost of an FRCP lab coat compared with a traditional white lab coat, and are there any special laundering requirements? Well, let's handle costs first. They're more expensive. Um, now, how much more expensive? It, it's going to depend a little bit on who you buy them from. We do not sell them directly to customers. We go through distribution channels, whether it be an industrial laundry or one of your uh, laboratory safety uh, or laboratory supply uh, companies that you might do business with. But uh, kind of a, a general sense, if you're paying in the range of $35, $40 or so for a, a current white lab coat, the new lab coat's uh, going to cost you probably in excess of $150. could be uh, approaching $200. But something something to remember is, number one, <clears throat> They last a long time. You know, they're they're very durable. They're going to last. You know, they're not going to wear out. You know, in you know, in a couple wearings. But number two, if you go back to that slide that showed the cost of burn injuries, this, for the sake of a hundred and fifty or a hundred and seventy-five dollar lab coat versus going to a burn lab that you know is going to cost twenty-five thousand dollars a day. You know, it, it it's there's no no question what's more uh you know what's going to be the better outcome not to mention the fact of the you know the injury the pain and suffering and so forth so it is a lot more expensive no question about it uh but um you know you get what you pay for if you have hazards you need protection you know you got to pay you know for whatever you need to to make sure that you have that proper protection for your employees next question do the frcp coveralls come in men and women's styles or are they generally unisex yeah hey i forgot to on the last question i forgot to answer the question about laundering um so uh standard laundering applies uh you know home laundering with standard uh laundry detergents you, you know you don't want to use bleaches or peroxides or any of that kind of thing on any kind of fr garment so you know just Home laundering with uh, standard laundering detergents uh, works fine. Uh, if you're working through a laundry processing company, uh, there are laundry instructions inside the garment. Uh, as long as they follow the instructions, there's no problem. Um, so, sorry, I forgot to answer that question in the last one. So, what's the question you just asked me? I'm just going to ask you if you wanted me to repeat it. Um, do the uh, FRCP coveralls come in men and women styles, or are they generally unisex? Yeah, the coverall would, uh, is a unisex at this point. The, the lab coat, there's a men's and a woman's uh, cut that are different, but the uh, coverall is just in a um, unisex design. On the next question, are you considering making FRCP lab coats in a heavier material? This person said they've experienced wear failure around the midsection from uh, rubbing against the lab counter. Um, we haven't considered that at this point in time. I know that uh, you know there can be, if, if you're going to rub a piece of fabric against a uh, you know, a bench where you're doing your experiments, if you're going to rub it up against their bag and forth, you're going to get some wear. Uh, that's just, you know, fabric is fabric. There's nothing magic about this. Um, I know that um, the, um, I don't know that there's any reason we're looking at a heavier fabric at this point because one of the benefits of the the product is that it's lightweight and comfortable and breathable. So if you ask, start adding weight, then you start taking away from the comfort and the breathability and those kind of things. So at this point, uh, there's nothing on the radar that tells me that uh, a heavier weight version of it, uh, you know, is going to be in the near offing. Um, our next question, for some smaller um, state, local, and private institutions, uh, the cost of these coats can kind of be prohibitive. Is there any way for these institutions to get reduced pricing? <laughs> well, I don't know because I don't sell them directly, and I'm not in the sales part of the business. I don't, I don't talk, you know, I don't make deals. That's somebody in the sales end. But that, you know, I don't know that there is. 
um, that's something you'd have to take up with whoever the distributor is that's uh, supplying the product. So don't have a good answer for that one. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you might have answered this question earlier, but I'll, I'll ask this one as well. Um, as long as you follow manufacturing instructions for cleaning, how long should a FRCP lab coat last? Well, we didn't talk specifically about how long it lasts, but you know, okay. from what I what I hear people say to me about lab coats is they don't get washed very often. You know, if they get washed, you know, three or four, five times a year, that's common. So with that said, and you're looking at, you know, lots of years. You're looking at, you know, that could last maybe 10 years with that kind of frequency. You know, if you're washing them weekly, then obviously that's going to uh, change that, um, change the numbers. Uh, but we we hear people that, you know, wear the lab coats that say, you know, they, they only get washed three, four, five times a year. So you're talking those could last you. And, again, it depends on your application and your situation, uh, but they could last, you know, six, seven, eight, nine plus years um, easily. So next question, what is the um, employer's liability in telling um, their personnel to launder their own uh, coats, if there is any? Hmm. Well, uh, you know, potentially. Um, you know, if, if they've been trained on what to do, if they don't follow the rules, uh, then, you know, I'm not sure who uh, who's going to take the fall for that one. Um, hmm, good question. Um, you know, again, it, it's one of those, there, there really isn't a whole lot you can do to, to mess them up unless you start adding bleaches and peroxides. Now, if you're talking about a blue lab coat, I'm not sure why you'd add bleach to the laundry process anyhow, but... Um, uh, I'm not sure on the legality of that. Who, who's going to who's going to be at fault if um, if the employee goofs up um, and because they were doing themselves? If they've been trained, if they have the right information about how to launder them, um, you know, it shouldn't be a problem. But uh, I'm not sure about the legality of it. I think I might know the answer to this question, but I'll, I will ask it. Um... Uh, if we have lab coats that are FR rated, should we assume that they are CP rated as well? Absolutely not. And uh, yeah, if standard FR lab coats are not CP rated. The ones that Bulwark sells, there's things you can look at that'll tell you. Uh, number one is the FRCP, the ones that have both FR and chemical protection, have a black collar and black knit cuff. The standard FR ones do not have the black color and do not have the cuffs. It also has a um, FRCP logo on it if it has both flame resistant and chemical splash protection. And if you look inside and look at some of the warnings and um, labeling and so forth, that'll give you an indication on what it is. So the, the, the giveaways are uh, we put a black color on it specifically so that you could tell that it was different than the FR one. From a distance, you can look and say, okay, they're wearing the FRCP one because they got the black collar one. This person doesn't have a black collar. They're wearing the FR only. So they're they're pretty easily easy to distinguish between the two. I would mention one other point that um, just came to mind. Um, I mentioned that the, uh, the FRCP one has a, a black cuff. It's got a black knit cuff. The knit cuff is flame resistant, but it is not chemical splash. Uh, right now, putting the chemical splash on a stretchy knit doesn't work. And if you're working with bad chemicals, you're supposed to be wearing gloves. So the gloves would protect your wrist area where the cuff would typically be. So the cuff is FR, but it's not CP. The back black collar is both FR and CP. So I want to remind everyone again, if you want to ask a question, type it in the uh, text box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Um, I do have a question. another question. Uh, do you foresee all labs requiring FR CP lab coats versus uh, regular CP lab coats in the future? Well, it seems to be a trend. Um, 
you know, because most labs, at least the ones that we're familiar with, do have both hazards. And having a, um, uh, a, a lab coat that protects from both is obviously an advantage. You don't have to buy two separate things. Um, and that can also get into the earlier the cost question. So is, is the uh, lab coat more expensive? Yes, but if you have both a lab coat and a rubberized apron, a splash apron or disposable, then, you know, then the cost can start to get a little closer together if you add everything up. But uh, our, I see the trend even in industrial applications where safety people are looking for multi-use products, things that will do more than one thing. Uh, you know, it gives them uh, some more assurance that it's going to be protective. Uh, it actually can lower the cost, and it gets rid of that whole thing about the wearer has to remember to go get the other secondary piece. That that puts that, uh, that human error factor in there that uh, we'd like to eliminate as much as possible. If, uh, if I... An FRCP um, code is damaged. Is it possible to mend it, or does it have to be tossed? Um, you can you can repair FRCP, and you know, and again, it depends on the degree of damage. Um, but I, you know, you'd want to if it if it's a hole that you want to patch. Obviously, you'd want to patch it with like material, uh, you, and you'd need to use FR thread and those kind of things. It gets a little tricky, um, but it can be done. Um, and, again, it depends on the degree of damage. You know, if you've got right in the very front of it where you could and most likely for exposure and you got a big old hole, then eh, eh, probably not. If you have a seam that's uh, torn a little bit to, to stitch that up on the side, uh, as long as you're using FR thread, um, that should work. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd say that um, if that's a situation – you know, you're you're best off to contact one of us, like myself, and say, "Hey, here's my situation. Here's a picture of what it looks like. Is that repairable?" And then we can maybe give some uh, guidance on what uh, what you should do. I was going to ask if um, if people should generally can they generally do it themselves, or, or they should they seek out expertise on that in that sort of situation? I was just for my own curiosity. Well. Probably can be done yourself, but again, it depends on the degree. How much damage is there? Do you have access to flame-resistant thread, which is typically the answer would be no. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it can be done, but it, it depends on the degree. If it's if it's significant amount, then I would say no. You probably don't want to try and tackle that yourself. Are uh, FRCP lab coats effective um, in protecting against cryogenic materials? Well, they're not not really designed for that. Um, I'm not I'm not a chemist, uh, so um, I don't have a lot of knowledge about cryogenics. Uh, but you know, it's 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 really designed more for the acids, corrosives organic solvents, those kind of things. Cryogenic, will it give you some protection? Well, it's, a, it's it's an added layer between you and the material or you and the spill or the splash. So, you know, in that regard, it may have some protection, but I we've not tested it for that, so I don't couldn't say with any degree of certainty that it would provide adequate protection. We do have a question about repairs. Would would any repairs or, or certain repairs void the uh, manufacturer's warranty? Well, um, you know, the warranty is basically that um, the the fabric's flame resistant for the life of the garment. Um, you know, workmanship um, on the garment is you know. Guaranteed for a, a you know a, a, you know I forget what the time period is again I'm not in sales so it's, you know maybe for a year normal wear and tear you know if you're going to have normal wear and tear or if you're going to do a repair on it I'm not sure where that fits into the 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 warranty uh, picture you know if you tear it on day one and patch it you know and 
then I'm not sure you can't send it back to us and say, Hey, I want a replacement garment. Uh, so, um, I'm not sure that that answered the question. It's, it's kind of a difficult one to answer. Our next question, are there tests for declines in, uh, fabric degradation, um, and things like that? I'm sorry, say that one again. Are there any tests for declines in um, fabric degradation? Well, you know, the the Nomex 3A base fabric that this is made of has very good resistance to degrading from exposures to um, lots of different chemicals. Um, and there's there's some lists. Uh, DuPont, who uh, you know is the fiber manufacturer for the Nomex 3A fiber blend has a list of all kinds of chemicals and how uh, those fibers react to exposure in terms of degrading. Um, so they've done some testing on it. I don't know the details on how they're tested, but there is some data on that. Um, so that can be made available if somebody's uh, particularly interested in a specific chemical and how the degradation is. Now, keep in mind, if that chemicals, liquid chemical is splashed onto the garment, it's going to repel off it's going to roll off of it so it it doesn't have much of an exposure time so that in and of itself would minimize the uh, potential for degrading uh nomex is is pretty good stuff in terms of degradation relative to chemical exposures and as i said um, there's published information with uh, lists of chemicals and the degree of degradation uh that the uh, base fabric uh, would be expected to see. For our last question, how often do I need to provide PPE training to each employee? Well, OSHA hasn't set a specific rule, but you know most people look at it uh, uh, annually. Um, you know, if an OSHA inspector comes in and asks, you know, people, hey, have you been trained on this? And they say, oh, I can't remember. Well, that's going to be a problem. So. I think most people look at it as an annual type activity. Uh, it's not hard and fast rule by OSHA, but um, that's kind of a um, rule of thumb that people use, kind of a standard uh, industry norm that uh, you do some annual uh, PPE training just to make sure everybody's up to speed. And or if you change, uh, you know, new people come in, obviously need to be trained. If you're doing some new tasks that you haven't done before, you need to make sure that they're trained those types of things. So um, that's kind of the way uh, that I've seen it in the past. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that ends today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. Um, as a reminder, any unanswered questions will be forwarded to our speaker. And we hope you uh, take the time to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen to give us your feedback. I'd like to thank Mark Saner, everyone at Bulwark Protection, and of course, all of our listeners. Have a safe day.